Lakewood Police over there and John Maxwell <laughs> providing security for us tonight. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. We appreciate it. Uh, well, welcome. My name is Jeff Hunt. I serve as the director of the Centennial Institute. If you don't recognize me, I haven't shaved since the Western Conservative Summit. Um, I went as Abraham Lincoln uh, this, <laughs> this Halloween. My kids loved it. I just put on a top hat. And I'm not quite as tall as Abraham Lincoln, but it was a lot of fun. Well, welcome. This is our Distinguished Lecture Series. We host uh, an event like this once a month, cover issues that we're debating here in our community, uh, things that we care about and uh, want to debate and discuss. And tonight we're going to talk about improving school safety. As we get started, I want to make sure that we recognize some of the folks in this room that are uh, uh, deserve recognition. I think oh, I see a Board of Trustees member back there, Gary Armstrong, raise your hand. Gary serves as the chairman of the Board of Trustees here at CCU. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate that. And of course, uh, it's Veterans Day. Are there any veterans in the house? If you're a veteran, stand up so we can recognize you. Thank you so much for your service. We appreciate it. Now, they've been making a lot of changes at the VA under Donald Trump, and uh, one of the changes that they just made kind of caught me off guard. It was interesting. You know, they're trying to reform the VA pension system, and they decided, you know what we're going to do? We'll just decide to bring in the veterans, and we'll measure from one part of their body to the next because the, the pension system's complicated, so we'll measure from one part of their body to the next, and we'll just give them $1,000 for every inch that it covers. And so uh, one of the veterans came in and says, well, I'd like you to measure from the top of my head down to my toe. And so they measured him and uh, they said, uh, well, that's 73 inches. So here's $73,000. And the veteran went out. The next veteran came in. He said, I'd like you to measure from one arm length to the other arm length. And so they measured that and said, oh, that's 74 inches. So we'll give you $74,000. And then a Marine came in. And the Marine said, I'd like you to measure from the tip of my thumb to my index finger. And the pension guy looked at him and goes, well, where's your index finger? He goes, I left it back in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Those tough Marines, hoorah. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to begin, as we always do, with prayer and pledge of allegiance. So please welcome Jordan Jantz and Daphne Guaz to come lead us in prayer and pledge of allegiance. And if you can, uh, please stand for this. like to pray for this event tonight for all of the panelists that will be speaking on this issue that is affecting us so dearly and so closely and I pray that you would give everyone here wisdom in their words as they address this topic that we would all consider the impact this has on our community and how we can make it better and always to bring glory to you I pray for everyone in this room that they would take what they hear to heart that they would be able to travel home safely and have a good night tonight and hopefully learn something. And thank you for this wonderful country that we're in, that we are blessed to be able to have the freedom to speak about these issues. And I thank you for all the veterans in this room and across the nation who have fought for that freedom. And so bless our night tonight, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. These are uh, two of our 1776 scholars here at CCU. Um, we have a very exciting thing happening at CCU. Last year, we took a record number of young people to the March for Life. We took 27 people to the March for Life. This year, we are taking 200 students to the March for Life. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Not only do we have a, basically a revival taking place of young people excited about the sanctity of life and protecting that, the organizers for the March for Life, which is the largest uh, March for Life rally in the country, probably the world, has asked Colorado Christian University to lead it so our students will be carrying that big banner with 100,000 people behind them. And I th when you think about what God's doing with young people, excited, standing up, and we've been waiting generations for this, and the young people are so passionate 
about the sanctity of life, and uh, we're so proud to be able to lead it. Lots of exciting things happening with young people like, uh, like Jordan and Daphne. Well, friends, tonight I speak to you not only as someone who cares about public policy, but as a father of four children, ages 10, 9, 7, and 6. I think about school security and safety every single day. When I hear about a school shooting, I get so frustrated. We're not, we've got to make these changes. We need to send a clear message that we will no longer tolerate these acts of violence upon our children. Recent school shootings like STEM, Virginia Tech, Parkland, and Sandy Hook demand security improvements to protect our children. Tonight, we'll hear, for, hear from experts in multiple fields to go beyond the rhetoric, implementing security improvements. We'll learn, about, uh, we'll learn what schools and communities can do today to protect their children. But before they begin, I want to lay out kind of two things that I think are, are challenges to our society that we need to address regarding this issue. First, we've had a continued rejection of God, religion, and morality that's resulting in a generation of kids without a compass, and without self-control. Our society looks at these issues and says that we have a mental health crisis. Well, mental health absolutely plays a role in it, but educating children without God leaves them without a sense of purpose, without dignity for human life, and without self-control. If you look at all the school shooters that we've, know, that we've seen in these past uh, few decades, they lack everything that I just mentioned, a sense of purpose in their lives, Compassion and dignity for their fellow human beings and a lack of self-control. Our society cannot function without religion and morality. We are reaping the harvest of a society that continues to re reject God more and more. And secondly, one of the big challenges we face are gun-free zones. For people who want to kill as many people as they can, we've created the perfect shooting gallery for them with gun-free zones. As parents, we must send a clear message that we will no longer tolerate the targeting of our kids. We must send this message with force. You cannot go to a rock concert, get on an airplane, or even visit a legislature, legislator at the Capitol without a strong show of force. We seriously protect what we value, and we must do a better job of protecting our children. And tonight, we're going to hear from a panel of experts to address these issues. First, one of my very favorites, Laura Carno. She's the executive director of Faster Colorado, an organization that trains authorized armed school staff in Colorado. She's also a visiting fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. She's been involved in campaigns and causes in Colorado since 2008, including helping to recall two state senators in 2013. Laura also runs springtaxpayers.com, an organization that keeps an eye on politicians and local government in the Pikes Peak region. She appears regularly in Colorado in national media and blogs. She is the author of the book, Government Ruins Nearly Everything, Reclaiming Social Issues from Uncivil Servants. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Uh, next is Don Lee. Don Lee has over 20 years of experience in education policy, products, and services. He's currently a vice president for K-12, a leading provider of educational products and services in the U.S., Don is also board chairman of Hold Fast America, whose mission is to embrace the principle that an individual has the right and responsibility to stand for what is right, to resist that which is evil, and with an engaged community of volunteers acting in partnership with government, business, and faith community, drastically reduce the frequency of attacks and mitigate the resulting injuries and death on ourselves and others. Don is a former four-term member of the Colorado House of Representatives. He was the vice chairman of the House Education Committee, and he has been a regular speaker on uh, school violence issues because he represented the area that included Columbine during that massacre. Let's welcome Don Lee. <laughs> we'll hear from Abe Layden, an elected Douglas County Commissioner in District 1. Uh, just elected to his first term, began here in January 2019. Uh, Abe's top priorities as county commissioner include cutting taxes, providing real transportation solutions, ensuring responsible growth, working collaboratively with law enforcement and the school board to make sure we have a proven safety solutions ready and in place to protect our kids and making certain we have clean and abundant air and water for generations to come. 
Layden is a proud fifth generation Coloradan and graduate of Colorado State University and the University of Colorado School of Law. Abe and his wife reside in Lone Tree with their three children. And Abe, if you followed any of the news, was recently a part of the effort in Douglas County to allocate $10 million to schools to improve their school safety. And that's what he's going to be talking about tonight. Let's welcome Abe Layden. And then Denny Dillard. Denny is the Chief Executive Officer for Hold Fast America. Mr. Dillard is an internationally distinguished security and law enforcement expert and senior program manager. He consults on numerous preparedness and prevention related programs, drawing on 40 years of expertise in law enforcement response and national security training exercises and program management. He spent 11 years with the LAPD. And I'm going to list just, if I read his bio, it would take the rest of the evening. Uh, he served the Department of Defense Joint Military Program. He served the TSA, Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI. Following 9-11, he drafted the original language for the Crew Member Self-Defense de Training Program, which was added to the Federal Flight Deck Officer Program as part of the 2002 Arming Pilots Against Terrorism Act. So uh, let's welcome Denny Dillard. So this is our panel tonight. Uh, they're each going to provide 10 minutes of opening statements. I'm going to ask a series of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions as well. Uh, Don, why don't we start with you, and we'll work our way over towards Denny. Okay. Is this thing on? Oh, yeah. testing. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, well, Jeff basically gave my 10-minute presentation already, <laughs> so um, I'm going to ad lib now. But uh, actually, um, you know, on the way in tonight, uh, Rachel and my wife, who's here in the front row, uh, the third seat here, you know, we, we drove by Columbine High School, and every time I drive by Columbine High School, I just kind of get that, that shiver, that feel from that day on April 20th, 1999. And um, uh, two years ago, uh, when the Parkland Massacre occurred, I got that same feeling because of the, 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 the eerie uh, similarities between the two. And I sat there in, in my hotel room because I, I traveled quite a bit, and I forget where I was. I think it may have been Nashville, North Carolina. But uh, I, I told myself, you know, what, why is it after 19 years the same thing happens? Why is that? It shouldn't be that way. You know, what have we learned? What have we enacted? What have we done? Look how far we've come in technology and in, in, in our culture and, and so on and so forth. Look, look what we've done with fire safety. When's the last time a child was, was, you know, died in a school fire? Can anybody remember ever, you know, in the last 20 years? No. Know, what about uh, you know, accessibility? You know, we, you know, we, we passed the, the, you know, the Accessibility Act, and, and we, we, uh, we make sure that, that there's, there's accessibility for, for people that are, that are special needs and so on and so forth in the schools and, and in our, in our you know, society. Uh, might make sure that the, uh, you know, the, the, the toilets are the right height, the, the, the drinking fountains are the right height, you have no ramps and accessibility for different things. You know, how much money do you think we spent on that? over the last uh, you know, 30 years, I think, since 2009. You know, billions and billions of dollars, mostly local money. Um, you think about uh, our food. You know, the food is, is, is under heavy regulation to make sure that the food that, that our children eat in the school is nutritious and, and not going to harm them and that they're not going you know, to be tampered with and so on and so forth. You know, we, we put a lot of effort in a lot of things about our, 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 uh, our schools but when it comes to school safety, I think what we lack is we lack on, on, on the building security, the physical security of, of schools. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, uh, a lot of things. A lot of it is complacency. I remember after uh, you know, Columbine, you know, I, I, I got a, a group of, of citizens together. It was a task force. We had about 70 members that, got, that came together, and we talked about, you know, what can we do different? You know, what is it that happened? What can we do different? And... Uh, in fact, I think Tina, you might have been part of that, if I remember right. Uh, and and everybody's like, you know, the last thing we want is the schools to look like prisons or feel like prisons. We don't want, you know, the, the schools to, to feel unwelcomely, uh, unwelcomely, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, Jeff made a good point. You know, what about you know, when you go to Coors Field? Do you feel like that's a prison because they, they search your bag and they make you go to a, um, to a magnetometer, or when you go to uh, the court, yeah, the courthouse, and you know whether it's the Taj Mahal or, or uh, you know, the federal building downtown, or when you go to the airport, do you feel like you know you're walking into the prison because they have all these security people, dogs walking around sniffing, you know, at your bags and things? Doesn't it offend you? No, it doesn't. We accept that for 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 a sense of protection, 
And I think that we need to start thinking more about that in our school buildings. Uh, we have the technology today that we have, there's, there are passive ways of, of securing buildings where the students don't even realize it's there. So it's a matter of doing it. Uh, one thing, that, another thing is, um, uh, let's see what time we have here. I got about, about five more minutes, yeah. If I can slow down. Um, you know, we have a, um, a department, a, de a department for fire, for, for uh, a division of fire safety uh, with the Department of Public Safety here in Colorado. Um, you know, it's a whole, de whole department. That's all. That's all they do is make sure that that uh, you no know, buildings are secured, specifically you know, schools as well. And there's all these standards, state standards, of what these school buildings have to meet. We don't have any standardization on, on when it comes to, to the safety of the school buildings um, that's standardized that, that we do with fire safety. And uh, all they have right now with the Department of Public S uh, Safety is you go to their website and they have a, a clearinghouse of links. So your school district employees uh, or administrators can go there and click on a link and it'll, it'll take them somewhere and, and, and tell them things about certain types of security. So, so it's basically the resource center. I think we need to do better than that. And I'm not a big government guy, but I think some things do need to be standardized. And I do th think that some things have to be mandated to be met, similar to fire safety in our school buildings. I think there should be some mandated st st standard uh, safety um, uh, criteria for our public schools. And it could be, uh, you know, we can talk about the cost later on, or, or we can talk about that later on through Q&A. But it could be something through... Uh, I mean, just, just after uh, uh, Park, uh, Parkland, uh, nationwide, $900 million have gone into student safety. And almost half of that was just in Florida, $400 million. A lot of that is, is through, you know, went to counseling. And, and I'm, all, I'm all about, you know, making sure that we're taking care of the issues, that, uh, the mental health issues that are, that are you know, some of the, the cause of these things. But it's a lot of money going into that, and I think the, the school buildings themselves are being ignored. So I think that uh, you know the state ought to you know, maybe start a working group, come up with some standardization with uh, experts such as you know, my friend Denny over here, and and put down put together some some uh, some standardization for what we sh should expect of our school buildings. You know if, when they do upgrades, when they build new ones, we can we can grandfather this stuff in. We can have matching grants. We can have uh, you know all kinds of ways of, of making that happen. But. Uh, um, I think that's that's one of the things that we need to really start focusing on from a policy perspective. Maybe we can use the marijuana money. <laughs> um, Laura, you're up. Yeah, th thanks, Jeff, for um, hosting this. Uh, the topics that we're talking about tonight are topics that when we see um, school boards talk about school safety, um, sometimes they don't include this type of conversation. So thank you very much for um, for doing this. So uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, uh, when it comes to school safety, we are for all of the above. So you're going to hear a lot of um, a lot of techniques, a lot of things that need to be done, all of the above. Whatever it takes to secure our children, all of the above. So um, what I'm going to talk about is the policy of armed school staff. And um, if you had told me a few years ago I'd be an expert in this, I would have told you you were crazy. But here I am. Um, a lot of folks don't know that it has been legal in Colorado for the past 16 years for school boards to designate people uh, in their schools to be armed. So 16 years in Colorado, that has been law. And so what do we mean when we say uh, people being armed? That um, it gives us is different than school resource officers or other private security. So this would be uh, teachers, janitors, uh, coaches, school nurses, lunch ladies, bus drivers, anybody who is an employee of the school. So um, after, um, gosh, after uh, Sandy Hook, a group in Ohio got together and said, and Ohio has very similar laws to what we have, and they said, we need to do something. We, th these teachers are sitting ducks and they are using their bodies to shield children from, from bullets. They have to have a fighting chance. So um, in Ohio, they put together, in just the days after Sandy Hook, a curriculum called FASTER Training. Stands for something, you don't need to remember it. I like the idea that it's called FASTER Training because the faster we stop the killer and the faster we stop the bleeding, the fewer people die. 
So uh, in Ohio, they have trained over 2,000 school staff um, since the days after Sandy Hook. So we brought that same curriculum here to Colorado, and um, we're in our third training year. We thought we were done in the summer, but we had um, additional demand like we had last year. So we have a, uh, a Thanksgiving weekend class, so they don't get to go Black Friday shopping. They're coming to class. Um, so th you probably don't hear a lot about it in the news. There are stories here and there. Um, but these policies are enacted fairly quietly, um, depending on the school district. And um, school districts can do this differently. Some school districts go into executive session and pass the policy and um, decide who the people are going to be. They all have a, a big process to vet uh, who can be an armed staff member. Uh, some have a very big public process. There was a school district uh, down south that asked me to come speak at one of their big open to the public meetings. It was a smaller community. I think every single person was there uh, at this meeting to really have a robust public process. So. You might hear about it in the news, you might not hear about it in the news, um, but I'm here to tell you that it, uh, the conversations are very robust out there about armed school staff. And why is this? So let's think about what happened in Parkland. Uh, Coach Aaron Feast used his body to save children. And you ask yourself the question from a couple of different standpoints. Um, number one, when people say um, teachers or coaches or whomever, don't have the mindset to, to carry a firearm on campus, uh, I say they, they are already saving children. They're just doing it with their body because that's all they have. So they do have the right mindset, selected people obviously. The other thing is um, people like Coach Aaron Feast or the counselor in Sandy Hook, don't they have a right to defend themselves? And uh, Jeff mentioned gun-free zones, and schools are federal gun-free zones. And so these folks, many of them have been concealed carry holders for many, many years, if not decades, and they're disarmed when they go to the most vulnerable place that they are all day, a school. So do they not have that same right of self-defense that the rest of us have? They have it in the parking lot or at the 7-Eleven across the street, but the second they go to work with our children and our grandchildren under, under their care, they are disarmed. And so we think about it from, from many of those, um, those standpoints. So we brought this training here. I mentioned it's called FASTER training, and um, I have cards, but you can check it out at fastercolorado.com. Um, and we've got lots of information, uh, lots of media there. When media calls me, I say yes, because it's a free way to get our, our message out, right? So what do we do at this training? So once a uh, school board has said, yes, we're gonna have a policy of armed staff, and once they have um, worked through their process on who the people are that are going to be armed on campus, they have to get training. And uh, our FASTER training is, it, fits what they need to get, it actually exceeds what they need to get for their, um, uh, for their insurance policy. And uh, what's a little bit special about what we do at FASTER is we know, number one, that most schools that are early adopters of this, uh, this program, uh, they're small rural schools. And these aren't schools for whom a school resource officer is even a financial option. And um, for many of them, um, a, a tuition of a thousand bucks, completely not possible for their, for their budgets. So what we do is we raise private money so that they can come through 100% for free if they need to. Um, and some schools can pay a little bit and that's fine. That's just a little bit less money that we have to, um, that we have to raise. Uh, we just concluded a raffle. Um, we have all kinds of creative ways to raise money for these scholarships. Um, just awarded a really cool Sig Sauer gun package to um, the winner out in Elbert County. So, um, so this class, it's um, the the curriculum is um, very similar to what you would uh, law enforcement teaches their SWAT teams on how to stop active killers. How do we know it's the same curriculum? Because the guys who teach it. Uh, teach SWAT guys in their active duty law enforcement. Um, the test that the school staff have to pass when they 
um, complete faster training exceeds the post qualification um, in handgun proficiency. Post is a law enforcement, um, see a lot of heads nodding, Most of, uh, many of you know what post is. Uh, it's a peace officer standards and training and it's the test, so to speak, that um, law enforcement has to pass when they get out of the, the academy and there's lots of different layers of it. Um, one of them is handgun proficiency. So we've taken that handgun proficiency standard, uh, we've added two additional shots and they still have to pass at 100% uh, to pass the class. And then on top of that, we <coughs> add medical training. I mentioned, I like the, I like the fact that this is called faster because it reminds us, faster you stop the killer and then faster you stop the bleeding. It took medics 45 minutes to be cleared to go into Sandy Hook. How many children could have been saved? We don't know the answer to this. How many children could have been saved if there had been people with uh, the knowledge, the training, and the, the equipment, tourniquets, uh, to be able to save lives? So um, the medical portion of our class is taught by um, you know, a couple of different instructors who are uh, people who teach life-saving medical skills to law enforcement. So how do you save yourself if you get shot? How do you save your body if he or she gets shot? Um, so that's what we do in a um, very short amount of time, very concentrated um, a class. There's, um, I, I won't name the person or point to him or her in the class or in the room who's been to our class, but it is mentally, two people, mentally and physically exhausting um, at the end of this three-day class. So. I'm um, excited to be here talking about school safety. When I mentioned all of the above, what I'm talking about armed school staff, God help us if we get there. But thank God if, if we do get there, if somebody has broken through every level of security uh, that we have in, in place at the schools and somebody is killing the children, we have to ask ourselves the question, in that moment, in that hallway, in that uh, classroom, in the cafeteria, if that happens, who is going to save the children? Um, thanks for being here, folks. All right. Thank you. Abe. Well, thank you, Mr. Hunt. My name is Abe Layden, Douglas County Commissioner. And, you know, this is really an exciting night because uh, it, it was once said that you should never doubt the ability of a small group of people to change the world. In fact, nothing else ever has. I think this group can be a beacon of conservative leadership, and I'm so thankful for my fellow panelists and all of the hard work and dedication that they've put in for years uh, into this particular topic. I think we also need to give a hand for uh, Jeff Hunt's beard. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I did a No Shave November for Men's Health. I think he's been doing No Shave spring, summer, and fall, but uh, I really want to thank him. I want to thank his wife, Nicole Hunt, for serving on our physical school security committee uh, over the summer, and then also a couple of individuals in this room. Uh, I come at this very humbly, um, not as somebody who says he's an elected leader, I'm a public servant, I work for you, not the other way around. I like that you hold government accountable. Uh, I'm occupying the government's seat, the, which is the people's seat for right now, and so I wanna be part of this conversation. But uh, as I come at this humbly, I wanna really acknowledge um, Clint Doris, who's in the back, uh, has had just decades of military experience and served as the chair of our, our physical school security committee. Um, obviously, Nicole Hunt. And then also, uh, my dear friend, Tom Shuffle. I don't know if he's in here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> so I started my career with Tom Shuffle uh, in the practice of law. Gosh, nearly, what, 15, 20 years ago, Tom? And we've had a lot of fun. Uh, he he t teaches business law here, and I remember getting to uh, to substitute for him, and it's uh, just fantastic. Anytime I get to come back to CCU, uh, he lets me sometimes um, judge the mock trials here too with Chuck King, which is a lot of fun. Um, but unfortunately, this year, about well mid-April, I, I put a post on social media. I was recently elected to the office, and one of my commitments was to make sure that no child ever got killed in a school shooting in Douglas County on my watch. And uh, on May 7th, I will never forget getting the text from the undersheriff saying, school shooting, get down to the substation immediately. And uh, my fellow commissioners and I were immediately whisked away to Highlands Ranch right behind the AMC Theater where we were briefed by the FBI and uh, the sheriff and then pushed out into a press conference. And after we learned that Kendrick Castillo had lost his life trying to save his fellow students, 
Uh, I stepped out of that press conference, took off my badge, took off my coat, and I went across the street to the Northridge Rec Center where a lot of the students and many of the teachers were huddled and confused and very upset about what was going on. And I said, you know, my thoughts are with you. That did not resonate. I said, I'm sorry. Uh, that did not resonate. Uh, I, I was praying for them, which helped a lot, I think, uh, certainly from, from all of our mutual perspective. Prayer is not the at least you can do, it's the most you can do. Um, but what they really wanted were solutions. Um, to my fellow panelists' point, it's been 20 years since Columbine. Certainly not the first school shooting, but probably the most significant on a national stage. And so a lot of folks were saying, okay, enough of the blue ribbon panels, enough of the, of the conversation. What are we actually doing to solve this problem? So I always like to say, uh, you can't spell Douglas County without the words do, D-O. We actually like to get things done, so I give a lot of credit um, to my fellow commissioners who are not here tonight, uh, Roger Partridge and Laura Thomas, who collectively said right after STEM, we're gonna do something. We're not gonna wait for uh, anyone to give us marching orders. We're gonna reflect the will of the people and get something done. Thankfully, we don't have debt in Douglas County uh, and through some conservative budget budgeting over many years prior to me, uh, we were able to appropriate $13.3 million immediately for school safety. And what we did with that was uh, $10, $10 million in one-time funding for physical school security and mental health, uh, $3 million for ongoing funding for SRO, student resource officers, and then $331,000 for a youth CRT program. So in Douglas County, we have what's called the, uh, the, the mental health initiative, which has gained some regional notoriety because of the CRT program. And that is where a law enforcement officer rides along with a mental health professional. And if somebody in a mental health crisis calls, they don't get hauled off to jail or diverted into the criminal justice system. They actually get directed to mental health care, which saves a lot of money in government on DA's prosecution uh, and law enforcement. So we're, getting, we're trying to get people the uh, mental health care they need. We've expanded the program to reach youth because a large portion of people that were needing the CRT program were youth. So that was a big part of the process. The other part, we, we continue to believe as conservatives in Douglas County, all three of us are, are conservatives and again want to be that beacon of, of conservative leadership um, in Colorado. It's, a, it's an interesting time here right now, but from our perspective, um, we believe that the best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And there is a lot of buy-in in our community for the idea of an SRO, for, for a trained officer to be in schools. And I love Laura's comment. I, I would support her on that. Uh, the, the notion of uh, having trained individuals uh, in schools, I think that's a wonderful barrier. Um, but I would also agree with, with the comment that it is not one solution. I think we're all looking for what is that one thing that's gonna solve the problem? Well, the reality is there is evil in the world. Satan is a, a real, real entity. And we are fighting a spiritual battle on a daily basis not against flesh and blood, but against these demonic forces. So we know that there is evil, but we can create huge speed bumps to that evil. So it's not just one solution in terms of arming folks, arming trained individuals. It's probably about 20 solutions that we wrap around students to keep them safe. So what we did, uh, again, humbly, we're, we're non-experts. Uh, again, we're holding the people's seat as commissioners. We represent uh, 368,000 uh, people with a $470 million budget. Uh, and what we said was, let's get the experts in. So we formed two committees, of one of mental health professionals, a nine-member committee, and then a nine-member committee of physical school security experts, including Mr. Doris in the back. And these folks have phenomenal military experience, uh, NASA, Department of Defense, Secret Service. And so uh, throughout the course of the summer, they were charged with the... Uh, the responsibility of providing us with final recommendations for the Board of County Commissioners to appropriate that $10 million in a way that is fiscally appropriate, but also related to actual solutions. We didn't want to fund pea shooters. We didn't want to fund uh, things that were fluff. We wanted to fund things that actually were going to work, that had some evidence and some research behind it. So uh, some of the things I wanted to share um, are, are part of the top funding recommendations that we landed upon from our committees. So really the number one is that school uh, building security, having that limited and secured access, uh, physical improvements to the interior, physical improvements to the exterior, uh, door locks, bollards. Uh, when you go to Target and you see those enormous uh, 
falls in the front of Target. Those aren't decoration. That's to make sure that a semi doesn't drive through the middle of the school. Uh, they're cheap. And that's an easy way to protect our schools, and that's something that our committee uh, has made public in one of our hearings. Uh, we've also talked about training for law enforcement, security guards, school personnel, uh, parents, and students. And one of the programs we, we heard about that I'm a huge fan of is the idea of watchdog dads. And it could be moms too, it can also be grandparents, but it's dads that just have kids in schools. They might have a military background, law enforcement background, but each dad rotates and shows up at school and just walks the halls, greets the students, connects with teachers, and makes it a point to collaborate with the on-site SRO and the security personnel to keep the school safe. That doesn't cost us anything. And we've got amazing grandparents and parents in this community, probably a lot of you with some great background and experience that we'd love um, to have you employed in that capacity. So something to think about. Um, we also talked a lot about mental health. So there's, of course, the physical building security, there's the SROs, and then there's the mental health issues. Um, we heard a statistic from the University of Colorado uh, Center for Violence Preven Prevention that Dylan Klebold had about 121 red flags of errant behavior before he did what he did at Columbine. So people knew. And if you ask any eighth grade class, who's that one student, who's that one kid that you might be a little worried about? promise you most teachers, most students are going to know exactly who that is. So part of what we'd like to do and what we're funding is curriculum and programming around social emotional learning and mental health, making sure that there's resilience programming in schools and that there's opportunities for schools to identify kids that may have these issues under a rubric of trauma-informed care. And if you're not familiar, trauma-informed care is really around this notion of um, isolated kids, kids that have parents that are uh, abusing substances, kids from broken homes, they may need to be um, taught and cared for in a different way than other kids. And flagging those kids ahead of time, not in a way to, to alienate them, but to identify them, get them the care they need before they're 15 and they become a Dylan Klebold is part of that solution process. Um, so a couple of the other things and then I'll, I'll move on. I, how are we doing on time, Jeff? Good, a few more minutes. Okay. So we also talked about anonymous bystander reporting systems tied to mental health. And you might have heard about text to tip or safe to tell, but these are reporting systems that allow uh, kids to report if they see something that's just off, a kid brings something to school they shouldn't, they talk about, hey, it's an AK-47 type of day. Um, they're able to text that tip or send that message to safe to tell and immediately get a response that's monitored uh, within our community. We wanna expand upon that and provide that as another option for kids. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that there's communications that are uniform across all schools, making sure that um, whatever system they're on in terms of radios, apps on their phones, they actually have the same system. They have an alert that every teacher and administrator gets at the same time and they're not disjointed. So, um, Finally, one of the things that's really important to me, a couple, two final things. One is, when I first came into office, I came upon the idea of having a three-digit mental health line and didn't get a lot of traction on that until over the summer we heard that Congress um, has been working with the FCC to actually pass a 988 number, where again, people aren't diverted into the criminal justice system if you have a mental health issue, anxiety, panic attack, depression, Suicidal thoughts, you can call 988 just like you would 911 and get access to a mental health uh, professional. Now the question is, as a fiscal conservative, who pays, how much is it gonna cost? So trust me, we're taking a very hard look at that, but we're working closely with uh, Senator Gardner to advance that. And the final thing I'll touch on, and I know this is a lot, we've been working on this for, uh, for a while um, with our experts, but the other idea is around portal security. Um, we would like to do uh, and are exploring a pilot program for innovative technology, uh, including the opportunity to monitor folks as they're coming into a building. I recently was exposed to a program called Athena, which will actually, through the camera system, identify folks that may be approaching the school with a weapon, flag that, photograph it, text that immediately to an SRO, and it comes up as a photo. Because unfortunately, a camera system is usually unmonitored or can oftentimes be unmonitored. Um, by security personnel. So we wanna make sure that that gets flagged and could be flagged, so we're looking at that. And then we're also looking at things like MetroSense and a few other programs that have, we, we've sort of moved on from metal detectors because we constantly hear about the issue of, 
of funneling and the issue of um, not wanting schools to feel like a prison, these systems can be hidden in the walls so you don't see them or at least camouflaged and, and vinyled so that they have the school colors on them. They recently were used at the Avengers premiere where Gwyneth Paltrow and Bradley Cooper were walking right through them, barely noticed them. Um, but what they do is they can identify with uh, that ferrous, ferromagnetic signature potential weapons. So we're looking at some of these solutions. And again, we want them so that people don't have to divest, meaning they can walk right through. So some of these systems can actually process 4,000 people in about 13 minutes. So uh, again, there's no single solution, but we are looking at all of these options to wrap around our kids. So again, thank you for allowing me to be here and looking forward to further questions. Great. Thank you, Abe. Denny. Thank you. Appreciate it. Always a, a joy to be able to come and, and speak in an environment where I can share my faith as, as well as my profession because being a warrior and doing what I've done for the last 42 years now since I was an 18-year-old kid and got out of high school even while I was in college is, uh, is to protect and to serve. Um, but met Jesus when I was 15 years old. Met my wife, Paula, who's here in the front row that same, uh, that same year. And so... It is important for me to, for you to realize that and in this kind of a setting, we have the opportunity to, to talk about that. Because there are a variety of different things that we can do. But as Abe was talking about, Satan is real. Evil is real in this world. He is that, you know, he is that lion seeking out whom he may devour. And so we are either going to put somebody in front of our kids to resist that devil, or we're not. Or we're going to teach our kids to survive that attack, or we're not. So there are a variety of solutions, many of which you've heard about some really great ideas already tonight. Many of those solutions are already on board and, and heading in the right direction. And we want to be part of that ongoing solution. Uh, at, uh, at Hold Fast America, which is inspired by a scripture out of 1 Thessalonians 5.21 that says, Hold fast to that which is right, or that which is good. And the right thing for us to do is to take care of our children, okay? Is to take care of our grandchildren and the kids in our neighborhood. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that might look like, excuse me. Started out with LAPD in, in 83, um, went through the police academy there, enjoyed every minute of it because I'm kind of built that way. Um, walked a foot feet in Skid Row, Chinatown, Little Tokyo, worked a gang unit called the Strike Force for Chief Gates back in the 80s. We hunted bad guys, that was our job. We weren't just sheepdogs, we were Irish wolfhounds. We went to get the wolf and make them go away so that they couldn't kill and rape and do the other nasty things in our communities, both to our schools and, and throughout the city. Um, you know, so many of, of the folks here in the military have done the same things around the world on behalf of our country to take care of our country. And, and on Veterans Day, thank you, Colonel Rosser, appreciate it. John Andrews, thank you, sir. Two of our board members for Hold Fast Colorado and Hold Fast America. And, uh, and we are, are very excited about that. Jimmy Graham, thanks for your service, brother. And Jimmy runs a program called the Able Shepherd Program, and he's been busy getting it done, just flat out getting it done for several years here in Colorado now. Quint, thanks for the work and the leadership, brother. You know, and we can all work together to continue to make this thing get to the next level. After 9-11 occurred, flight attendants and pilots came to me because they'd heard about my background in teaching and physical training, self-defense, survival skills at LAPD, out at the college level of teaching credentials at UCLA to go along with my management science and business law from Cal Poly. Two weeks after 9-11, as a matter of fact, flight attendants came to me and said, help, we're afraid to get back on board the aircraft. Our, our carriers don't know how to teach us this stuff. And the FAA doesn't require that they teach us how to protect ourselves. Can you help us? And to me, that was a magic word because teaching and helping are the two spiritual gifts I have. I protect and serve, but teaching and helping is what I do to make that happen. So largely, not just a Christian, but a knuckle-dagging street cop from, from Los Angeles to bring solutions that, that seem to work for our, for our country. We trained 210,000 flight attendants and pilots after 9-11 in crew member self-defense training in a variety of levels. Now in that secular setting, we taught things like awareness and deterrence and avoidance. We taught verbalization skills, empty hand control, intermediate weapons, uh, blocking, movement, body stance, 
balance, things that you might learn in martial arts, all the way up through deadly force. We put together the Federal Flight Deck Officer Program. I was the director at TSA in 2002 and 2003 in charge of, of both of those programs. So it's a volunteer training program. There's a lot of them out of the military that said, pick me, I'll be involved. Right? And they put forward their own time to get the training and money to do that as we were putting that volunteer program together that still goes today. So we're trying to do the same thing here. So with Hold Fast Colorado, I said to myself, look, we, we need citizens to be aware and the ability to protect themselves and each other when law enforcement just can't be there all the time. I know I've been the guy on the other end of the 911 call, right? I can't get there, I can't be everywhere. Even if we have an SRO at every school, and I hope we do, I love the SRO program, but even if we have one in every school in America, the shooting takes place on the other end of the school. There's been several shootings where an SRO has been there. There's been several shootings where we've had armed security guards that have been there, but we're still not stopping kids from dying. So we have to take a very holistic view of what we're going to do, and we have to look at this from not just a tactical standpoint, the legal standpoint is incredibly important, the psychological, the medical, right, all of those things. The policy standpoint, we bring groups of subject matter experts to bear and work on a consistent basis, and we can make that happen. After Sandy Hook started, uh, happened in, in back in 2012, I sent together a white paper and went to the Obama administration. And I know it got to the White House because it was delivered by some colleagues of mine at the Department of Homeland Security. And they decided to pursue gun control instead of this answer that we got here today. And we're still not saving kids' lives because Parkland happened, STEM school shooting happened, and there's more that are going to happen right around the corner. See, if one child matters, they all matter. If one school matters, they all matter. So how do we take and start from here in Colorado in the Denver metropolitan area, in areas like Douglas County where the last school shooting took place, and build that into a program that can take care of all of our 93,000 plus schools across the country? How do we do that? The same way we took a program called the Guardian Project for the Department of Defense and protected every military base we have around the world. A joint military program, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Army, even the Coast Guard, right? all of the above. Everybody was involved, all those bases. And we protected them from chem, bio, rad, nuke, and explosive threats. It's an $800 million contract, and I was a project manager that, that got to redo all of the planning, all of the training, all of the exercises. If we can protect our military bases, can we protect all our schools? Absolutely we can. We just have to have a little bit more imagination on how we're gonna fund this thing. So I looked at a model that said, look, schools don't have a lot of money, and I get it. And some counties are more wealthier than others, and I understand that, and that's helpful. But we're going to have to use our imagination if we're going to pull this together in a way that's going to be appropriate and effective. We're going to need some new laws. We're going to have to work together to get that done. We're going to bring the guys that have the tactical expertise to give us the right solutions to not only train the people that are going to be at the school protecting, whether it's the teachers and the administrators and other folks on the staff. And our idea is let's put retired law enforcement former law enforcement and military and firefighters and emergency medical people. We all raised our hand already and said, I'm in. I'll run into the burning building if I have to to take care of the kids. I've gone down range in an active shooter event already with bullets flying at me and everybody else running the other direction. I'm built that way. I'm trained to do it. So we take those kinds of volunteers and say, do you have kids? Do you have grandkids? Do you have neighborhood kids that you care about? Are you willing to go to your school and spend volunteer for maybe four hours once a month to do that? How many would do that? If I gave you a choice to go protect your kids, your grandkids, how many would do that? Yes, and I'm seeing those same hands go up all around the country, 
right now. Okay, so it's layers. Just like we build layers of protection around the cockpit of an airplane so we can't have a plane be taken over anymore. And we put in a hardened cockpit door to try and stop it just before they get in there. And we have an armed pilot on the inside just before they take over that plane. We've got to do the same thing. Now the principal point of protection isn't the cockpit. It's our classrooms where our children are, where our teachers are. See, our elementary schools, they can't take care of themselves. They're our lambs. We got to take care of them ourselves. So why not let guys that we can recruit, put them back through a vetting process, make sure they're physically and emotionally healthy, retrain them for a specific mission to be at our school. And I don't care if it's 40 volunteers or 80 at a school and you spend one four hour block once a month, we can do that because we know how to train them. We've got subject matter experts across the country and plenty that are right here, some of which are in this room that I already mentioned. They can train those folks to do that. It's about organization. It's about a model that allows us to do that. And in my mind, that has to be a non-government organization to make that happen. Because the government has already proven to me they can't and they won't. So Hold Fast America is a nonprofit, 501c3 non-government organization. Now we will work with government at the federal, state, and local levels. I said we will work with the government at the federal, state, and local levels because I will never go back to work for them again. We will work with them. They don't get control over this, but there is a wonderful model called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Anybody heard of them? They do the Amber Alerts, right? They got signed into law and they get money from the Department of Justice since 1982. And they are very, very effective. And I've worked with them and I've met with them and that's the model we need to design here. So Hold Fast American has worked hard to bring a Citizen Awareness and Protection National Center to Colorado because we've had more than our fair share of these shootings, not just in our schools and our theaters and shopping malls and everything else. We need to work together to get that done. We can make this happen. We have the ability to make this happen and that's what we're here for. We need to hear from you and what your ideas are and then we can work together to make that happen. Thanks for your time. Great. Appreciate you being here tonight. Great, thank you for your opening statements. Jenny, what I love about that approach is that it's something that we can do today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a way that we can get involved today. And uh, uh, I think that's the, that's the vision of America is that uh, if there's a problem, we don't wait around for somebody else to come. We fix, fix it, it ourselves. Yep. We go out there and serve our neighbors. So I, I appreciate that. I've got a few questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, the show of force. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it's important, but we, uh, but at the same time, we, we don't want to have to expose our kids to the kind of jail-like systems that, that you kind of mentioned, Abe. Um, show of force communicates a lot to people that want to do bad things, right? We TSA is a show of force. If you want to get on an airplane, you can't take off your socks and your shoes, maybe not your socks, but your shoes and your belt and everything else. Uh, police carry weapons that are visible, not only for easy access, but it's a, it's a physical deterrent. When somebody walks up to you with a gun on their hip, um, you have the show of force there. I would say that uh, Donald Trump's wall is a show of force. It's not going to stop everybody from getting in, but it's, it's communicating that we take this law seriously and we're going to do what's necessary to protect. So um, we're in this interesting time where I think all of us that grew up in schools where elementary schools were open and easy to access and you just walked in because it was a neighborhood school and it's your friends and it's your community. I think those times have moved past. And we're at a place now where we need to provide a strong show of for force and, and strong security. But um, you mentioned there's some ways to kind of hide the security as well. How do we balance all that? Uh, I, I like the idea. Uh, that there's armed guards at the door of my kid's school. I think it sends a strong message. Um, but at the same time, what are, we, what are we communicating to our kids in the community as a result of that? So I don't know, I can open it up to Don or Laura, Abe, Danny, any of you yeah. want to speak in on that? 
Wow. Ladies okay. First. Go ahead, Laura. I know you can jump in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that uh, there's show of force and then there's presumption of force. Mm -hmm. And so think about um, a gun show where nobody's open carrying, let's just say. Um, so you're not seeing it, but there's an assumption that um, if somebody wanted to go in there and commit a crime, that they would be met with force. So there's a presumption of force. Um, so, and uh, Denny mentioned, um, we love our school resource officers and um, they do more than obviously um, act as a show of force. Um, but when, some, when there is a, sc a school resource officer in a school where a shooting happens, it's because the, the killer chose to start it somewhere else. So uh, sh shouldn't we have that presumption of force mm -hmm. sprinkled all throughout the school? And you know, I mentioned some of the positions we've had, you know, the school nurse and the lunch lady and the bus drivers, literally all over the school. Um, and, and I think when that is, um, when that system is in place, when that is the, uh, when we're in um, more than just 34 school districts um, uh, that have armed staff today in Colorado, um, when, when it's all over the place, like it is in Ohio where it's the assumption that if you go into that school and try to do something bad, it is not going to end well for you. Then, then our schools will stop being soft targets then they will stop bringing evil to our schools. And that's going to be a dynamic change. So um, I think there's a show of force, and I think there's a presumption of force um, that could create that good balance. So I would agree with that response. I, I think it's really important to frame the conversation so that everybody in this room, who I think we're all friends, we understand what's being said out there, and I think a lot of folks get this. Um, you know, I have a friend who's been a teacher for 20 years, and she's like, I really appreciate what you're doing, but you know what? As a teacher, I didn't sign up to work in a prison. Okay, interesting. And so that, that's what I'm hearing out there. We, uh, Commissioner Thomas and I, were asked to testify at the state capitol in front of the Interim School Security Committee, which the state legislature has convened throughout the summer, and we were placed on a panel with several members of the ACLU. And as we were sharing some of the solutions that we, we felt our, our committees had arrived upon. The comment from the ACLU, uh, with all due respect, was, well, uh, minority students and students with disabilities are being disproportionately targeted by SROs. So that is the, the dynamic that we were surprised with when we, when we showed up at the Capitol. So I, I had to uh, respectfully interject at that point, and I said, you know, um, it's interesting because our school district, who I, I respect, we're collaborating with them, even though we're philosophically um, a bit different. They've decide, decided to use their bond and mill levy money to hire about 91 counselors in Douglas County. And listen, I am all for mental health. I think counselors can be very significant, um, and they're doing a lot of other things, which I think will also help keep kids safe. But I said, you know, when I walked into the Capitol today, I was not met by counselors even though maybe we, we could use some at the state <laughs> legislature, right? Um, you know what I was met with when I walked in the doors? There are not enough counselors in the world. I, I'm with you, John. I'm with you, John. Um, I was not met by, by counselors when I walked into the Capitol. I was met by security guards and a metal detector. And there is this narrative out there that kids are afraid to, to go to these areas that are more secure. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 2-year-old. They are not afraid when they go to Mile High, when they go to Coors Field, uh, when they walk through the detectors at Target, even though they look different, that's exactly what they would be. Um, so I think the kids are used to it. But the argument is, well, if you have these security measures, the kids will funnel, you can't get them through, and they're going to feel like they're in a prison. And the number one fear of students is being shot at school right now in 2019. Hmm. I'm more concerned about that fear than this feeling of campus should be wide open and we just should have a, a free for all. So it's competing considerations, but just so you understand what I'm hearing on, on the other side, this is what we are, what we're up against. So in my thought, there's, it's real easy to get wrapped around the idea of a school shooting. These are low likelihood, high consequence events. We get that. But the perception by our children is, I may get shot at school because that's the kind of press that's happening. The reality is the threat is 
multifaceted. How many explosive devices were there at Columbine? Anybody know? 99. 99 explosive. Now, you've probably never heard about that. Had they been better bomb makers, you would have heard about it. Their goal was to burn the whole school down and kill everybody in it, not just shoot them to death. Almost every active shooter and terrorism act that we have in this country and around the world involves explosive devices today. Now, ISIS is saying things like pick up a knife, pick up a machete, drive your car. Okay. We're, we're missing the boat here. It isn't just about other kids shooting other kids. Now, that's important, and I'm not saying we forget about that. But there are many other threats that we have to adjust, and to do that, we have to have this multi-layered approach to getting that done. Physical security is one of those things. But eventually, eventually, one of those bad things is going to happen in our schools again. Are we going to have the people there that are trained and capable of responding to that in seconds, not minutes? Douglas County Sheriff, and I met with Tony Spurlock shortly thereafter, like two weeks later. Don and I did, and John Andrews was with us. You know, he, he loves the idea of what we're talking about with Hold Fast America. Because we're not there to be police officers. We're there to stand in the gap before the police officers can get there to protect those kids. Okay. I want all of our volunteers to have as many tools in the toolbox as possible. A firearm it would just be one of those. Whether they carry it in an open carry or concealed, doesn't matter to me. Okay. Each individual school district, each individual school can make that decision. We're currently working with two private schools that want us to be in uniform, open carry. We'll do that for them. But we will not look like police officers. We will not look like special agents. We will not look like military. And guess what else we won't look like? $15 an hour security guard because that's not who we are. We're professionals. That's who we are. So we can get this done in a way that allows us to use other skills. Who's ever heard of behavioral recognition? So what does that mean? Anybody want to give me a definition of behavioral recognition? Yes, sir. Okay, so in a nutshell, for a street cop like me and the guy that was hired to train the folks at the Port Authority in New York and New Jersey where they own the trade centers and the train systems in New York and around the area, I want to know what's the behaviors associated with somebody that's going to start killing people. Behavioral cues, right? Facial expressions and body language. Weapons cues. Tactical cues. Things that I can teach teachers, students at the right age, parents, as well as our volunteers to pick up on. And then how to have a conversation about drawing that information out so we can stop these things from happening way before they start to happen. Mm -hmm. Including things like, why is little Johnny being bullied? And how do we help Johnny not be bullied? And how do we talk to the bullies and make sure they know it's not in their best interest to continue down that road? Because the Secret Service just put out their report last week, right? And they said almost all of these shooters have been severely bullied at some point in, in their life, not just online, but face to face. So our folks will be there at every level of the school, walking the halls, talking to the kids. Hi, I'm Mr. Dillard. How are you doing today, Johnny? You doing okay? Can I help you with anything? If somebody shows up to come from the outside before they get in there with that guitar case, we're going to take a look at the guitar case because we can and we will. Not because we're cops, not because we're security guards, because we're capable, we're professionals, and we're willing, and we're going to get that job done. Right. And if, if I could just add yeah. really quick to that, Jeff, um, we, we hear a lot in the news media when we talk about this topic about what happens if we have to stop a killer. And uh, I just want to underline what Denny's talking about. We spend a tremendous amount of time in training talking about de-escalation because almost – Almost everything that any security personnel is going to do, whether it's a school resource officer, private security, or an armed staff member, 
does not involve having a firearm out. Almost almost um, nothing is going to involve that. Almost everything is going to be de-escalation. And so it's the part that sometimes doesn't make the nightly news, but it's the reality of how um, how people are trained, whether it's an armed staff member or um, law enforcement or military. Um, Don, Abe, you, you all have looked at um, physical security improvements that can take place on a school. Um, Clint, I know you, you did that as well. You're welcome to speak into this. Um, what can schools do to improve? I think Sandy Hook, he shot through. The door is locked. He shot through the side, crawled through. Um, what are some actual physical security improvements that you're seeing from schools? Well, the example you just gave at Sandy Hook, they, they have uh, there's different uh, uh, products out there. Uh, one's called Clear Armor. It uh, basically it uh, it's a film that goes on the, the window and it's uh, bulletproof. Um, I think it's, I forget what the cost is, like hundred dollars square foot. It's not inexpensive, but it's tactically ap applied in, in uh, you know main uh, thoroughfares, you know entry, ex exit ways, you know so on and so forth. And also uh, classroom doors. Uh, some some schools you go through, they actually have windows in the hallways into the classrooms, and external windows in the classrooms. Those are all uh, you know soft soft uh, you know projectile entry points. Um, you know, there's also another product that uh, that helps protect against uh, you know uh, that goes on the walls that uh, that, that, that prevents uh, um, firearm penetration and also bomb uh, explosion uh, impacts. You know, those could be applied to the hallways of a school. You know, a lot of these shooters, I, I hate to you know, share this in the public meeting, but do a lot more damage um, if, they, if they knew the, uh, the, uh, the situation uh, with, with the hallways and the lack of protection within hallways of schools. Mm -hmm. um, hate to go into a lot of these things because, you know, it's a public meeting and you don't want to get into kind of the, the trade secrets of what we do, but yeah. uh, that's some of the things we can do. Hey, do you want to add anything? Yes, and I would echo that. I mean, uh, of course, we've had phenomenal experts sharing with us these solutions, but of course we don't want to be too specific and, and put our kids at risk or, or give people other ideas. Um, but, but absolutely, I mean, things that have been talked about publicly um, certainly include uh, what Don just shared. And then again, like I said, there are opportunities. Part of it, I mean, if you look at the, the Dayton shooting, you know, the, the officers were able to neutralize within 30 seconds after the guy f fired his first shot, but he had a 223 caliber high capacity rifle with 100 round magazines, um, and that's 30 seconds was all he needed. So there were nine people dead and about 27 others injured in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So virtually, what is it, 100% of school shootings are over almost 100% in under two minutes, almost 100%. Um, and about 50% are over in, in about 30 seconds. So they're very fast. So part of it is, yes, we need armed security, armed personnel, folks with training, but even with that training, what are we doing to make sure that rifles don't get in in a guitar case? Um, and that's, you know, j j just sharing what's been, been on the public record. So um, two things, again, that, that we're looking, that I'm looking at is from an innovative technology standpoint, um, when people talk about metal detectors, the comment on the other side is, look, there's going to be funneling and a big line outside if people are going through them. And then again, people don't want to feel like they're in a prison. Great. So the new technology out there, these systems can be hidden in the walls. You don't even see them there, or they can be camouflaged. Um, and again, you can walk through them without divesting. People aren't taking out phones, taking off belts like you would at the airport. You just walk right through. Um, and, and the other big thing is making sure that a lot of folks can go through. Schools are busy, they're active. Um, and again, the new tech technology has systems where 4,000 people are getting through in 13 minutes. So what I wanna continue to say is, and, and I'm really thankful for our school board in Douglas County. They've done a lot of work for many, many years uh, with Rich Payne to make sure that our schools are safe. Um, and they, over time, have, have grown to trust us and know that we're coming alongside them to help with some of these measures, but um, there is this philosophical difference between a wide open school and a school that's safer. And, and part of it is, um, you know, do we need nine entrances that are propped open during the day? Mm -hmm. Or can some of them be fire alarm doors, right? Where, okay, you can get out in a, in a fire or an emergency, but normally they're just locked. It's just the typical doors that say emergency, exit only. That's cheap. 
uh, and that's a, a way to, to limit the number of entries. So um, looking at that, and then the other one again was the, the camera technology that can identify in a camera system people that are entering with guns and immediately text that to law enforcement. So, um, and, and real quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge Corey Nelson, uh, who was also on our physical school security committee and spent many years before I got on board um, working on the Keep Our Schools Safe Committee because he has a passion as a dad and as a prosecutor to keep our kids safe. And also wanted to acknowledge Rob Williams from Ascent, who's also a, a wonderful dad and, and leader in our community. Great. All right, at this point we'll open up to questions. Uh, Stacy, do we have a microphone? Mira, we'll bring you a microphone. And uh, we have uh, some folks. If Go ahead and raise your hand. Why don't you, we'll start over here. Great to listen to you guys. Um, you know, one thing I want to point out for you, Mr. Lee, between uh, Columbine and STEM, you know, that, you know, it's very rare that you have a two-shooter set. And, you know, the things that we've done with law enforcement, uh, implementing standard response protocol, implementing run, hide, fight, um, that was able to severely limit the casualties for that STEM shooting. I, I, know, I know it's still awful to lose Mr. Castillo, um, but, you know, him and his two buddies that rush that guy, uh, you know, they were trained behaviorally to uh, meet that threat, which is a terrible burden to put on our children. Um, they, you know, we should not be requiring them to be the ones to meet that threat. And I don't want to poo-poo um, physical security, but you know that, that was the behavioral um, things that we implemented that, that helped in that particular situation, right? Um, security is dynamic. Um, you know, the over on Skid Row, there's still guys growing up, and there's still guys raping out there. And there's still guys earning their badges and stopping them, right? So there's no end point for this. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, uh, and I'm a firearms instructor as in a, a football coach at uh, Douglas County High School, and that's a lot of fun. Go Huskies. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, when, when I train people, there's uh, kind of two ways, you know, I, I kind of look at evaluating, you know, whether or not they're able to, to do that mission. You know, one's competency um, and one's temperament, right? And I get a lot of people in my classes who, you know, come in with their black rifle coffee hat and their brand new 511 tax shirt that do not have the temperament to do that job. I will say, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we haven't, uh, some people have talked about teachers, some people haven't, but um, one of the things I point out to you is that teachers um, do have at least half that equation, temperament, right? <laughs> Probably don't have the other competency issue. Um, and they also are very familiar with their beat, right? They're the ones who know best, um, you know, what the, d what the everyday dynamic is between their kids that they care very much about because they chose that profession. And I wouldn't put it on any teacher uh, who didn't want to have that mission to do it, right? But thinking about um, just how much more familiar they are. You know, another thing is STEM, um, and you know, there's only a, a couple news outlets that decided to actually release this information, but um, you know, there was a security officer who made some bad decisions at the STEM shooting, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a professional, right? That's professional, but not a professional who's super invested in those children and super invested in the school necessarily. Um, so, uh, you know, I just would like to expand the teacher idea and, and see what you guys had to say about that. Laura? Yeah, it, I'd like to, thanks for that question. I appreciate it. And um, I'd like to address teacher competency. And, w and when we say teacher, it is shorthand for school staffers. Um, the, the numbers are that um, the folks that have come through Faster Colorado and Faster in Ohio, about 40% are actually teachers. 60% have some other um, role in the school, but um, we use it for shorthand a lot. So um, you bring up a good point that we should never um, impose that on somebody. Um, the number one myth about armed staff policies around the country is quote unquote, and it's almost the same quote all, all of the time, is you can't make teachers carry. And I would like to dispel that myth right now. Nobody anywhere across the country has ever said the school staff should be ever required to carry a firearm. Patently ridiculous, but we keep hearing that. So thanks for bringing that point up. Um, and, and here's to the willing and able part. Um, if they're willing and they're in, that, they're in that hallway or classroom, but are they able? And um, so think about Colorado has about 9% um, of Colorado citizens have concealed carry permits. Is it logical to think that some of those people work in schools? Absolutely. Um, also consider that um, many of the first adopters of armed staff policies are rural schools. 
Lots of people who work in rural schools grew up in rural areas. They grew up around firearms. It's, it's nothing different to them than a power drill, for example. Obviously, it uh, takes a lot more training, but it, it is a normal tool for them. So um, by and large, um, the people that we see in our class, it's not a, a, a beginner class at all. Um, but we see people with, you know, two to 20 years experience uh, carrying a firearm on a daily basis, except when they're disarmed to go to work. And these are people who, um, and I know as a firearms instructor, you see lots of different, um, I get it. Um, these are folks who seek out training because they know that they're in that position um, to defend life, to defend the life of other people's children. Um, we very, very frequently see they do their required training, and then they're out with our instructors doing more training and more training and more training, which is great. So um, in, until folks have, have seen the class and, and met the people, um, it, it's stunning the level of um, willingness and ability that we see. Right. Janine. Mira will bring you the microphone. Wait for the microphone so the people online can hear from you. Thank you again. Um, uh, as a mother of four children and former PCA president and a nurse, and also I, I've heard a lot of hard things like external locus of control, all the firearms, all the training. But um, the only thing I heard on, a, on changing the kid is social and emotional learning. And I've got to say that talking about your feelings is good. I get that, social, emotional. But what we do uh, with the Center for Relationship Education is actually change the climate of the school by teaching kids how to care for one another. It's about um, that family feeling. It, you want a prison? Okay, I, I, I get it with all the things that you don't, it doesn't have to feel like a prison, but it should feel like you belong there. It mm -hmm. should, because the research shows that if a kid belongs to his family, he belongs to his friends, and he belongs to his school. They are very healthy. It's a, it's a precursor to as a determinant of health. Mm -hmm. So um, I just would like to share with all of you that we are here in Colorado, where we train teachers all over the country, and we would love to see the climate change in a school that kids are caring for one another. That's great. Denny, maybe you want to respond to that? Or Abe? Go ahead, Abe. Well, I, I will say keep doing that, okay? What we're suggesting has nothing to do with say, saying that we're, there's either war, no agenda. right? We, we continue to do that. In fact, if I'm a grandfather, so I've got not only my fifth grade school teacher daughter-in-law, but four kids at an elementary school, a lot of assets in one spot. Now, I'm happy to go to that school and stand there and say good morning to every teacher and every parent and every kid and love on them, you know, because I'll take the bullet if I need to. I want my grandparent, I want my grandkids and I want the teachers and I want my daughter-in-law to know we can take care of you. Whether you choose to carry or not is your choice. Whether you're willing and able to do that is your choice. I want kids to be kids. I want teachers to love on their students and take care of themselves. And I want professionals like myself to be able to do the job that I've been doing for 40 years to take care of this country. And I just know that there's an awful lot of other people like me that are willing to do that. And we don't have to make it look like a prison to make that happen. Yes, I, I just want to tell you, we are absolutely looking that, at that. And you are 100% you are right. Those early preventions and early indicators are so critical. Um, I, we've been doing a lot of interactions with <coughs> local Douglas County students that are working on sort of internal indicators and, and social uh, determinants of health. I sit on the State Public Health Transformation Steering Committee. Um, but at Thunder Ridge High School in Douglas County, there are a couple of students that have started a program called OASIS, which is literally just a dedicated space within school that has you know, therapy dogs and the opportunity for kids to decompress. Now, some folks may say, well, that's fluff. Let's do reading, writing, and arithmetic. True, but, but a big part of what, what I've been trying to do is connect with student voices and hear from what kids are going through in 2019. Um, we did the Youth Congress at the State Capitol with 40 kids from Douglas County, and I was recently at a Shepherd of the Hills Church with uh, a number of kids that just lost a friend to suicide at Arapahoe High School. And what they're telling me is, you all think it's social media and all of these other things, and, and the real problem is the adults. 
they say that, and this is definitely true in Douglas County, we're the healthiest county in the country, also the wealthiest outside of Washington, D.C. The problem is that the parents have these internalized pressures to keep up with the Joneses and project success, and then they are also transferring that expectation onto their kids in an implicit way. And so having a safety net and an outlet, a safety valve on a daily basis to express those challenges, and again, that sense of belonging and sense of community, that's why the social emotional learning piece is so critical and we want it wrapped into the curriculum so that part of what they're doing is, it's not just feel good, it's how, do you, how are you more resilient? How do you process stress? Because uh, the stress is gonna be there. But I'm so thankful for, for you and programs like the one you mentioned, because that's, that's a big part of what we're looking at too, so thank you. Uh, yes, Regina. Address oh, that a little bit. Yeah, sure, Clint, go ahead. So uh, to your point, um, kind of amazing, there was an a FBI Secret Service study over the course of about 20 years. Uh, there were 47 school st uh, shootings in that time frame. And uh, since then, uh, people will pick up that data set and slice it a different way on a, you know, and review it for different things. Back in 2013, the Secret Service um, looked at it from the aspect of uh, with all of these shootings and, and these were school shootings, uh, how many people knew the shooter and did they say something? So they called the bystander study and uh, this was part of our report. Um, mm -hmm. So you're right, ma'am, you hear a lot of physical security and those type of things, but what was very intriguing and sad to me was that 82% um, of the time there was a, a peer that knew that the shooter was gonna do what he did or she did. And over 95% of the time, they never said anything. Now this was 10 or 15 years after those shootings, so the FBI went back 30 years to get this data. My guess is that it wasn't just 82% of the time, I guess it was probably much closer to 100% of the time. And that was before we had social media, right? So uh, to your point, I mean, we, we saw this as a big, cultural issue, right? What does it say in our society that, that a child um, that's gonna do harm, their peer, whether it's a classmate or a sibling or somebody from work, is not willing to say something, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. But I think it gets to, there's a much bigger issue here, right? And physical security makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Having the right kind of folks on hand to uh, stop a shooter make a difference. Uh, you know, I joke that if one SRO is good, then, then 10 or 15 are better, right? You're not gonna, these schools, Castle Rock or Castle View High School is 100,000 square feet. You can have three folks there with a gun, it's not gonna make a difference in enough time. They need more people involved. But there is this other cultural aspect that I think that we're completely overlooking uh, in, in, in a large picture sense, if you will. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for two questions, Regina. And we'll do, unless there's one over here. We'll finish over here. Mira, we'll go. Thank you. Well, my, my question kind of follows on what he was just talking about. You've got a political correctness factor um, that's, that's being driven a lot by, by school districts and school boards that want to keep the the numbers, they want to keep their numbers looking good. They want kids graduated regardless of, you know, whether they belong in the school. They don't want to report incidents. So how, in the midst of all this, do you address that issue that you've got uh, administrators and sometimes teachers, you've got the local law enforcement, sometimes even the FBI, who knows where some of these problems are, but for a, a variety of different reasons, nobody handles it. So how do, how do we... You know, does all of this just overpower it? Do we have put so many parents and, and protectors and so forth ourselves in the schools, or how do you address that particular political correctness issue? Basically the Parkland issue, right? They, they knew he was a problem. They kept shuffling him along without really addressing the problem. Anyone want to take that one on? Yeah, I, so the answer is the law. And if you're familiar with the Claire Davis Act, um, you know, obviously in – State lawmakers in 2015 passed that act uh, after a, a girl that was killed by a fellow student at Arapahoe High School. And what I would say is hold your school boards accountable. Under that act, uh, basically, it's a waiver of governmental immunity on acts of school violence and allows civil lawsuits to be filed. So school districts are required to prove 
that they exercised reasonable care to prevent reasonably foreseeable murders, first degree assaults, and felony sexual assaults. That's already on the books. So, I mean, before we start passing new laws, which we probably need to do, let's make sure that we're enforcing the ones that are already on the books. Yeah, and this is about parents and grandparents. Um, consider, um, we have a lot of choice opportunity in Colorado of where you send your kids to school, right? You can send them to the neighborhood school here, that one over there, the charter school here, the private school. We have a tremendous amount of choice. So consider, consider looking at it this way. You are um, hiring a school to educate your children. And part of that education is that you want your child returned home alive every single day. So you as the parent, you interview your school, you talk to your school board, you talk to your principal and superintendent, what are they doing? And uh, Regina, you, you bring up such a good point about what happened in, in Parkland. Um, there's a book, if you're interested in um, all, of the th all of the thousands of things that went wrong there, um, there's a book, I see a lot of people nodding, um, who have read it already, uh, it's by Andrew Pollock, who lost his daughter Meadow at Parkland. And he was, uh, he just was a bulldog. He is not letting go of everything that went wrong. I tell parents, read that book. If only two of the 77 things that went wrong there are going wrong in your kid's school, you need to know about it because if they are, um, uh, they don't want their numbers to look bad, they don't want their reports to look bad, and, and children are, are less safe because of that, that is not okay. Um, so. Uh, great question, and um, Andrew Pollock is not paying me to say that, but it is an amazing, it's a terrifying book, but it's an amazing book to get. Right, can, can I say one thing real quick? Yeah, on this? Go ahead. I've been ed in education for over 20 years. You know, I was vice chair of the ed education committee and been dealing with school districts and, and you know, uh, state board and boards of education and, and district and uh, departments, and they don't like to do what, uh, what they're not vested in. If they don't have an interest in, in doing, you know, implementing a law and, and, and complying with the law, they're not going to do it. And I've seen that over 20 years. I saw when I was in the legislature. I remember getting constituent calls and having to call the you know, CDE across the street and have them call the district and say, how come you're not you know, complying with the law? You know, they're not going to comply with something that they're not done a vested interest in. I think that the answer has to be more of a, you know, a, when it comes to a, a comprehensive security plan, it's got to be site-based. It's got to include the, the, you know, the community, it's got to include the teachers and the, admi the administration, they ought to be bought into it. And that goes you know, with the, uh, like the Safe to Tell uh, system that's been very successful. It actually came from uh, Congressman Tom Tancredo after Columbine, and it's been modified ever since, and it's, it's a great system. It, 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 every day there's there several calls that come in uh, to Jeffco alone, just on the Safe to Tell line. It's been phenomenal. But you know the answer is is um, you know we're compartmentalized you know, c uh, civilization right now. You know the, the kids are they're all they're all walking around like this. You know, my wife and I just got back from Israel about a month ago, and one thing they really we really recognize out there is the families. Are, you know they're like families. You know, they, everybody's not you know, stuck on their phone. They're actually out having a good time talking to each other, and uh, and and a lot of that I think is because they all have to serve in the IDF, and they're all doing behavioral recognition around them. <laughs> You know, making sure nobody's you no know, looking at their kids the wrong way, and I think a lot of that has to, to do with it. And I think, you know, you know, Denny is, is is spot on. I think, you know, maybe in high school we all need to take a class in behavioral recognition. You know, because I think that's a lifelong you know value to have, and it's going to keep our society safe from it because our society is, not, is is becoming more and more unsafe. You know, you're talking about the schools and the uh, the presents. You know, the presence you know will deter uh, you know an idealistic type of um, attacker you know a terrorist you know someone jihadist that kind of person if it's an internal there's a kid that just wants to, to vindicate himself to the to the students that have been bullying him he doesn't care how many people are walking around with a gun he's going to you know, figure a way to try to get in there and, and you know, vindicate himself so there's so many variables involved it's got to be site based it's got to be continued communication there needs to be cultural changes you know people need to start you know telling their kid put your phone down you know, let's eat dinner together, you know, let's go to church. I mean, there's all kinds of answers to, to the school safety issue. There's no one silver bullet, no no pun intended. But, you know, I, th I think that we all need to you know, keep working together because I've been hearing it for 20 years, ever since Columbine. And, you know, it, and nothing against you know, you know, what we're talking about here tonight, but I heard the same thing tw things 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and it's like we haven't learned or we haven't really taken it serious enough to really do something about it. And... Uh, you know, you know, by golly, you know, we need to do something about it and, and really, you know, come together on certain things and get it done, check that off, and let's actually, you know, work our way down the road and make our school safer, safer today. Right. Last question here. 
Hi, uh, I uh, have a friend of mine who taught in Denver Public Schools and she is African American and she told me that she, she I wanted to ask forward her question to the panel and uh, she said that why are there very few inner city school shootings but they're all wealthy white areas is it you know mm -hmm. financial that the kids actually have access to firearms they could actually purchase them and a second comment I wanted to make was that um, I, I have a Hispanic friend of mine whose daughter she has two daughters in their 20s and 30s who teach um, elementary school in California and they have been approached or it's been suggested to them that they can carry guns. I mean, in California, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was just shocked. I, it just blew me away. California, you, you know, teachers packing heat. So I, that, that is what I had heard. And I wanted to ask if you th thought those things were true or false. That's it. Thank you. Well, answer to the last question, I'd be shocked literally shocked and dismayed if California is going to let all their teachers carry weapons that want to, even with or without the training. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's somebody that's uh, learning. Are, are uh, you familiar with that? So California is the only state that I know of that has gone backward in, um, in their laws. They had previously a law very similar to Colorado's. And um, when we think of California, we think of Los Angeles and, and San Francisco, but there's a lot of rural areas in California, and many rural schools were taking advantage of, of that policy, um, but they went backwards. So with, with no, pro never had a problem in any of the armed schools in California, and the legislature, it's just within the last six months or so, uh, uh, went backward on that. And I think about you know, these rural schools, and I'm not sure where your, where your friend is, if it was a rural school, but it, it could have been one of those that went backward. Yeah. So let me address the issue of firearms in the inner city. They have absolutely no problem getting firearms in the inner city. Okay, it has nothing to do with them having the money to get the firearms, a wealthy kid in the suburbs or, or something like that. Nothing to do with that. There's plenty of access in the state of California still, as well across the country, where they can get firearms in the inner city, and they'll continue to do so, no matter how many laws that we pass. Okay, so every gang, every, you know, it's just there. And it's, it's just part of what happens. And let me just finish this by saying, even if it's not firearms, you know, if a bad guy wants to commit a crime, um, interpersonal human aggression, rape, murder, something along those lines, they're gonna figure out a way of doing that. 19 men got on four different planes on 9-11, and not one of them got on the plane with anything illegal that day, not one and they committed one of the most horrendous attacks in our country. So eventually, people like Claire Davis are gonna find themselves face to face with a gunman or somebody with a knife or just the willingness to kill them with their bare hands again. So are we going to protect her? Or are we going to try and teach her if she chooses to, to protect herself? We gotta put these layers in control so that that doesn't happen again. And unfortunately, it will. All we can do is play this continued cat and mouse game to get better and better at it and stay in front of the one step in front of the bad guys as best we can. All right, thank you. We're going to wrap up with just one statement from each all, each one of you. I'd love to know one thing that the people can do when they go home tonight or tomorrow to improve the safety at their schools. Um, we'll start with Don. You're on the spot. Well, I think my last statement kind of covered that already. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wrapped it up already. Have dinner but, with your uh, kids? Yeah, I mean, you know, turn the TV off. You know, sit down, have dinner with the kids, talk to them. You know, make sure that they don't take their, their, their phone to bed with them and they're up till 2 in the morning texting their friends, being bullied, cyberbullied. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of, I mean, the teen suicide rate is phenomenal. It's always been a phenomenal problem, especially here in Colorado. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, there's more than, than just the, the violence and the students do the violence. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural shift and, and, you know, and just start with uh, hugging your kid and, and listening to him and trying to engage him. Be an active and engaged parent. All right, Laura. It, same, active and engaged parent. Find out what's going on at your kid's school. Um, you, they are your children. You are hiring a school to teach them and return them home alive every single day. It is your job to know what's going on. Uh, if you hear from your principal, your superintendent, your school board members that 
don't worry, we've got some PhDs who know what's going on. Sure, it is your right and responsibility um, to direct the upbringing uh, and education of your children. Um, ask the questions, they owe you the answers, they work for you. All right, thank you, Laura. Abe? Well, I, I realize I'm in, I'm in government, but first and foremost, I'd say pray. You gotta pray. We're, we're up against uh, satanic forces and we've gotta focus there. Um, but what you're doing is the right thing. You're here, you're spending your evening with us because you care, your parents, your grandparents, you're engaged. So hold your school districts accountable. Ask them, do they have a plan in place consistent with Senator Tom Weems' 2008 bill that said they have to have a NIMS coordinated plan? I mean, it has to already be in place. Um, so make sure that your kids and grandkids are in a school district or at a school that, that has a plan. And then volunteer to be a watchdog dad. Volunteer to use your know-how and expertise as an American to show up in these schools and help out. Uh, it's your tax dollars. Uh, they're not the boss, you are. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Let's get organized and work together. This is a call to action. I can't tell you one little thing that you can do, especially since I don't know any of you individually, but I can tell you, you can, you're welcome to give me a call and we can sit down and we can talk about it and we take all the skills and expertise and the critical thought that we can all put in this and work together and we can make a change if we do that. Great. So uh, we've heard a lot of good ideas, but I think the overall arching theme is that we need to be involved in our communities. We need to be involved in our schools. We need to be involved in our families. We need to hold our school boards accountable. We need to be present on our school, uh, on our school campuses. We need to be there with our children and grandchildren. Um, this is one of the big challenges we face, Denny, in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we have, as Americans, uh, before ri rised up to take on these issues. And, um, I think we can do it again, but um, can we give all of our speakers a round of applause for their work tonight? Thank you, Thank you all very much. I have uh, just two quick announcements. Um, our next Distinguished Lecture, se Distinguished Lecture Series will be in partnership with the President's Office. It will be in search of ancient roots with Dr. Ken Stewart talking about the Protestant Reformation. That will be November 18th. And then uh, December 9th, we're going to be hosting the CEO of Christianity Today as he talks about the expansion of the gospel uh, through new technology. So I hope you'll join us for that. Thank you all for coming out, and uh, our speakers will be hanging out a little bit if you want to talk with them. Thank you.